Oh, howdy y'all, grab yourself a drink. It is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Welcome to day nine of teaser season for patch 3.22 and the Trials of the Ancestors expansion. Today, we've got all of the new gems, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail later. However, I did do a very in-depth live stream, which I'll put a link to in the bottom left corner of the screen in the last 20 seconds of this video. You can have a look at that if you want to see my thoughts on all of the gems. Since then, there's been a couple of things that I've changed my mind on, and we'll cover those in this video. But basically, the gems have some absolute stunners, Volatility doesn't fit every attack build, but it is absolutely fantastic on some of them. Control Blaze is better than I thought it would be, but is not necessarily going to work for every single build in the game. And we also have a couple of stinkers in the form of Devour support, and I believe Sadism support is also pretty bad as well. But let's come back to those gems in a sec. Let's look at all of the other pieces of information that are easy to miss. Firstly, Guardian Minions. All of the details of these were revealed. This is what they look like if your character is level 85. Now these minions cap out at character level 85, so they keep getting better up to that point then once you hit level 85, they never get better again. The Summon Sentinel of Radiance looks like a walking, fighting decoy totem. We don't know how well this thing is going to fight, and I think it's going to live or die based upon that. It's not terrible by any means. It could be okay, it could be great, and we're not going to find that out until we see how well it both inflicts damage and how well it projects damage as well. All of that is still up in the air, but for now, Summon Sentinel of Radiance isn't the one to be excited about. It might be okay, it might be marginal, it might be great. But let's just assess it in the worst case scenario where it's pretty marginal and you just cast it for the 10% damage redirection instead. Summoned Elemental Relic though, this is the four pointer. So this is the one that takes a little bit more investment to get, but this thing is phenomenal. So this is something you have a 25% chance to trigger when you kill a nearby enemy or when you hit a rare or unique enemy. And that's a change from what was originally mentioned in the first teasers for the Guardian. So it's 25% chance to trigger when it goes off. It's going to go on cooldown for 300 milliseconds. That's gonna be important because this is something you can have up to three of. This is going to summon a relic of a random element. It is going to choose at random fire, lightning, or cold. Depending on the element chosen, the relic minion will have an anger, hatred, or wrath aura. We don't know the gem levels on this, but this is going to be a huge deal. You are going to get five seconds of an aura for free, and you're going to be able to refresh this, and if you're using a skill that hits very often, you are going to have near 100% uptime on this. Additionally, these relics explode when they die, but they don't just explode with a bang, they explode with a nuke. They're going to deal base damage equal to their life total, and that's almost 20,000, which is a staggering amount, even against monsters that have good resistances. Unfortunately though, if you already have a relic of the chosen element, all that happens is the duration is refreshed. The existing one's not going to die and be replaced. So I think it's going to be quite difficult to get this nuke to go off on demand, and people who want to mess around with it will probably have to build up all three relics, then they're just going to have to kite around until the five seconds expires, and then at that point, boom, 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 they get three massive hits. It'll be like Discharge, except instead of Discharge, it'll be much more damage. Much, much, much more damage than a top-end Discharge. So, Summon Elemental Relic does a lot of damage, but is fairly difficult to make that work. The key benefit to it is the fact that it is going to provide you with these auras for free, and a Guardian is going to have high uptime on all of those, as long as they're able to hit fast. That's going to give the Guardian a really weird identity, but it could be very strong. Additionally, this is going to be phenomenally strong to poach over on a Hierophant build, because Hierophants can't really manage to get Anger, Hatred, or Wrath going very easily, because they are probably playing some sort of mana build, and mana builds can't deal with having all those reservations. So keep that in mind as an option. You could definitely use this in conjunction with the Hierophant Ascendancy and Forbidden Flame, Forbidden Flesh Jewels. That is the Guardian Minions. Next, we have a couple of new tattoos. The tattoo of the Tukahama Shaman is going to replace a 10 strength skill and override it with 15 regen life per second. This is going to be very good early in the game and probably fall off late game, but still be welcome. It's still going to be better than the base 10 strength node, and so you're going to want to apply these unless there is a different tattoo that you want to apply instead to that particular node. The tattoo of the Hinakora Death Warden is going to replace an intelligence passive skill, a small one, and it's going to override it with 6% reduced effect of curses on you. This is a stat that I like to have at least 30% of on endgame characters if possible, because it provides you with a fair bit of defense against unexpectedly nasty things enemies can do to you. You don't necessarily need to be outright immune to curses, but being able to take the edge off them can make a big difference. And the tattoo of the Hinakora Death Warden is one option for doing that. At some points in progression though, I think I would actually prefer to have a Shaper Influenced Ring providing this stat, because the Shaper Influenced Ring will provide a lot more of it, 
And even if your character doesn't need a large amount of intelligence, you probably do need to get some of it from somewhere. But if you're in the north area of the passive tree, you probably do have an excess of intelligence that you don't need. And in that situation, you may as well turn some of it into reduced effective curses on you, unless there's a better tattoo for your character. The tattoo of the Tofar Herbalist is next. This one overwrites a small dexterity passive skill with 6% flask effect duration. Flask effect duration is a very powerful stat, and as a result, this is going to be used a lot. This is going to be very, very strong on a very, very large number of builds. This tattoo will also be a quiet achiever. It will make your character stronger. It will never sing out that it is the reason that your character is stronger, but especially on non-Pathfinders, this is going to increase your flask uptime substantially, and flasks are very, very powerful. As a result, this is going to make your character stronger in a non-obvious way and by quite a lot. And of course, I think it would be remiss of me not to mention Soul Thirst in conjunction with this particular tattoo, because I think you can see a pretty strong synergy between the two of them. Soul Thirst gives you Soul Eater when you drink from a flask, and Soul Eater gets stronger the longer you have it uninterrupted. Next, we have the changes that were made in the recently asked question section on the Path of Exile official website. The first question that was asked is, will a new Atlas Passive Tree Keystone Cassia's Pride, which is the one that doubles down on the tower defense aspects of Blight, Will that work with blighted maps? And the answer is no. Are tattoos permanent? The answer is that you can remove them with a scouring orb if you no longer want the effect of them, or alternately, you can overwrite them with another tattoo. So they're not permanent, and they're not particularly hard to get off, although you will need to invest an orb of scouring, which is something that's not a trivial cost up to about level 60 or so. After level 60, using an occasional orb of scouring is pretty negligible. How do tattoos interact with Timeless Jewels? So the answer is that if the Timeless Jewel changes the underlying node, then the tattoo is turned off, the Timeless Jewel dominates it. But if the Timeless Jewel just adds stats to it, then the Timeless Jewel will work in conjunction with the tattoo. There is an Atlas passive notable called Overloaded Circuits that causes Kirak mods to double down on effectiveness. Now, what happens if you allocate one of the four available Essence notables in conjunction with Overloaded Circuits, and then you select Essence as a Kirak mod? In this situation, Overloaded Circuits will just pick three at random of the four different Essence passives. And this is genuinely random, which means that there is no prevention of duplicates. If you get a duplicate, there's going to be no additional effect. So three times in four, your overloaded circuits is going to give you a disappointing result of choosing the essence notable you already have plus two others at random. And one time in four, it's going to give you a positive result where it's going to pick the other three possible essence notables. How does overloaded circuits interact with wandering path? Uh, the answer is very badly. For those people who are considering running a private league for Trials of the Ancestors, when can you start doing the administrative work that's involved in doing that? So set up, inviting people and things like that. That's going to be in the next day, probably when this video is about 18 hours old. Grinding Your Games will then make an announcement to that effect. Can we get more information about the Guardian Minions? Yes you can, and we've already gone through those. When will we learn more about 322's challenges and rewards? Those are coming later this week. It looks like GGG might be holding off on those to make it one of the last news posts that we get because they've given us all of the gems today, which is something they'd normally give later in the week. And next we have a thorny question. 3.21.2 was a performance improvement for the majority of Path of Exile players, but absolutely crangled performance for a significant minority of the player base. Originally when this patch came out, it was ruinous to my performance. Since then, something has changed and my performance has resolved itself, but that has not been the case for everyone else. And this question asks, what is happening? Where's the follow-up on this? The answer is that there's going to be follow-up tomorrow, probably when this video is 12 to 18 hours old, and then there's going to be more in patch 3.22. I really, really hope Grinding Gear Games nail this one, because if they stuff this up, and if the 3.22 component of this is ruinous, then we're going to have a really, really bad league launch. We might have the worst league launch since 3.14, so I really hope that they get this right. Finally, what's happening with Crucible League Monsters and the Forgotten Corpse Pool? The answer is they're not going to be Spectral Minions in 3.22. Okay, so that's all of the information that is not about the gems. Let's do a quick summary of the gems, but once more, if you are interested in my longer form thoughts on that, I do have an entire stream that went for about 117 minutes where we discussed all of these in a lot of depth. So you can have a look at that if you want, and there'll be things that will get missed in this because this is the short version. Okay, so let's start with Control Blaze support. There is a whole lot of numbers on Control Blaze support. What you need to know here is that there is a massive more multiplier to damage that you do with Ignite, but there is also a substantial less multiplier to overall damage dealt with the skill. 
And there is a sweet spot. Beyond that sweet spot, the less multiplier starts outpacing the more multiplier. So let's start with a simplification of this. Let's assume that you've inflicted 25 ignites in the last four seconds. Now this is more than you want to do with this skill. In this situation, the first line is going to give you 29% chance to ignite. The second line is going to read 350% more damage with ignite. The next line is going to read 75% less damage overall. Once you multiply this out, this is only a 12.5% more multiplier to your overall damage. I.e. Control Blaze is a terrible support gem if you are inflicting 25 ignites every 4 seconds. The sweet spot though is when you're inflicting 12 or 13 ignites in any 4 second window. In that situation, Control Blaze is the best support gem in the game. So this is an easy gem to balance around if you are fighting one monster at a time. All you need to do is get your attacks to 1 per 300 milliseconds, give or take a little bit, and then your Control Blaze is going to be an amazing support gem. However, that is DPS against a training dummy. Let's talk about how it changes in the real game. Let's start with the assumption that you have an attack speed of 0.3 seconds, and you're doing Maven's Invitation the Formed with all four bosses up. In this situation, you're going to be dropping down a couple of hits, and then you're very quickly going to hit 12 or even 16 stacks of ignites that you've inflicted recently. At this point, Control Blaze starts saying, oh, you're starting to get a bit out of control. The Blaze here is getting a little bit too hot, and we're actually going to cool it off a little bit. And if you do hit any more in that 4 second window, your next ignite's going to be pretty terrible. And if you do hit any more in that 4 second window, your next ignite's going to be pretty mediocre. That's not necessarily the end of the world, because the biggest ignite is still going to be on the enemy burning it. But, what's really going to confuse things is when the Minotaur summons his Earth Elemental adds and you hit those as well. Suddenly, you might find yourself quickly at 26 ignites inflicted in the last 4 seconds, and then at this point, all ignites you inflict over the next 4 seconds are going to be pretty mediocre. So that's Control Blaze. It's a difficult balancing act. It is tremendously effective if you're able to make it work, but it is something that is going to let you down in a few situations, especially when you're fighting a boss that summons a bunch of adds. I do think one of the best use cases for this gem is if you have an attack speed close to 300 milliseconds and you're hitting one enemy only, and then you're relying upon Ignite Proliferation in order to spread that around to other enemies and share the love that way. If you're doing that, Control Blaze support is an S tier support gem. If you're using it on a skill that has much more AoE, then this is not S tier, but it is still a very compelling support gem and one that's worth your while using. Next up we have Corrupting Cry support. The numbers on this are pretty good, but also there's a couple of things to notice with this. Firstly, Cost and Reservation Multiplier 1000%. These war cries are going to be expensive. Secondly, supported skills, i.e. supported war cries, cost life instead of mana. Thirdly, supported skills have less area of effect, which is a little bit rude on this. And fourth, the duration of the corrupted blood that's inflicted by the war cry itself is only two seconds. So even if you scale this up with all the passive tree support for duration, you're only really looking at 4.38 seconds at that point. And so you are going to need to make exerted attacks against the tougher monsters there. And a big part of that is that you just need to refresh the duration on the Corrupted Blood so that you can then hit them once or twice in between war cries. That's going to be the playstyle for this. It's going to be clunky and awkward, but the payoff is definitely there. This has damage much higher, much higher than Corrupting Fever does at the same gem level. Additionally, this is going to be phenomenal on a Forbidden Shaco. So, Corrupting Cry support definitely has the numbers there, definitely looks like it's got some uses, and it is my pick of the S tier Forbidden Shaco gem for this expansion. And next we have Flamewood support. Now, Flamewood is going to be a really interesting one. I was quite dismissive of this at first, but I have looked at the numbers, and it turns out that Flamewood support is going to make the totem that is spitting out projectiles do considerably more damage than a commensurate level fireball skill would, and because of that, I think that this is actually going to be reasonable. Additionally, I'll just point out that Holy Flame Totem has a text, Holy Flame Totem fires two additional projectiles. This could synergize incredibly well with Flamewood support. The overwhelming majority of builds don't want this support gem, but I do think it has some powerful synergies with the Chieftain that I am looking forward to exploring when patch 3.22 goes live. Guardian's Blessing is next, and let's snitch on the most broken use case for this. I don't think this will go live as is, because Grinding Your Games are already aware of this, in fact were aware of it before I recorded this video, but Guardian's Blessing support linked to Malevolence and also to Generosity does something particularly ridiculous. You as a player are not affected by it because Generosity support's involved, 
And that means that minions from supported skills take 14.3% of their total maximum life and energy shield as physical damage per second. While you have an aura from a supported skill on you, this doesn't apply. The minion is not going to be taking any damage over time, and this will be completely ridiculous. I do not expect this to stay as it is. I think this is a broken interaction, as it allows Guardian's Blessing to just bypass and give a huge boost to minion builds that other builds don't have an equivalent for. Yeah, other builds can invest in Energy Shield and use another Blessing, but that is an investment, whereas this is something that minion builds would get for free. So broken use cases out of the way. This is also very good in conjunction with an animated guardian, as long as that animated guardian is able to benefit from Mask of the Stitch Demon. You regenerate 1% of life per second per 500 maximum energy shield. All you need to do is give your animated guardian a percentage of its life added as extra energy shield. There's a few ways to do this, and that's going to be a tremendous amount of life that it's regenerating per second and that life regenerated per second will outpace 14.3% of total maximum life as long as your AG has at least 7,500 energy shield. It is not hard to get 7,500 ES on an animate Guardian. Once you've done that, Guardian's blessing on it is going to be incredible. However, that is going to be the reason that Mask of the Stitch Demon is going to be a very expensive item this league. This only comes from Incursion Temples, it requires an upgrade vial, it requires you to get a vial of summoning as well as a Mask of the Spirit Drinker. This is going to be this league's Slave Driver's Hand, the item from Incursion Temples that's going to be expensive for quite a while at the start of the league. That said, Guardian's Blessing, the numbers are there, this is a good gem and it will be used by a lot of people. One last thing you can do with this is that you can use it in conjunction with the Elementalist automatically re-summoning golems and that will be another way that you can get Guardian's Blessing really rolling for you. And that will be particularly good if you're one of those cruel people that loves playing around with exploding golems and minion instability, then you'll be able to take advantage of that setup in order to make your enemies suffer almost as much misery as your golems are suffering. Okay, so next we have Trauma Support. The first thing to note with Trauma Support is that it cannot support Bone Shatter. Supports melee strike skills that do not inherently apply trauma. However, you could potentially have a melee strike skill that's very fast attacking, that you use while linked to trauma support in order to stack up trauma, then you change over to a six link bone shatter. I think that's more of a cute combo than a strong one, but it is something that people will definitely play around with a little bit. And particularly in conjunction with a skill like Frenzy, it might work well. But let's talk about trauma support because this is one of those things that is generally not very strong on high end characters, except in a couple of weird situations where it is. So this has a lot of restrictions on what it can be used on. Cannot support triggered skills, vile skills, or skills used by proxies, including minions. And additionally, it can only be used with axes, maces, scepters, and staves. Now, this is going to provide flat physical damage based upon the number of trauma that your character's accumulated. And it's also going to apply one point of trauma when you attack and you hit at least one enemy. So the wording is very specific there. Gain one trauma the first time a supported attack hits an enemy. The intention here is that this shuts down multi-strike shenanigans and it shuts down situations where you hit an entire screen and gain 20 trauma and then immediately fall over and die the next time you attack. Instead, it is going to be a slow build-up and it's only going to be one per time that you spend mana on this skill and only if you actually hit something. You're then going to take a backlash damage of 146 physical damage per trauma. This is the stats at gem level 20, it'll be lower at lower levels when you gain trauma from supported skills and the trauma lasts 6.9 seconds by default. Now, the way you want to use this, you want to use this with a one-handed weapon early in the league. When you've got a bad one-handed weapon, this is going to provide a whole bunch of extra physical damage and it's going to make up for the weakness of your weapon. Particularly if you're using a skill that either does physical damage or that does physical damage with inbuilt conversion, whether that be Smite, whether that be Molten Strike, whatever it is, you're going to be able to get a whole bunch of extra physical damage from Trauma Support. However, the flat amount of physical damage that Trauma Support is gaining you is actually going to fall off pretty hard as your weapon gets better because it's not going to grow with your weapon, whereas other skills that provide a multiplicative bonus to damage, they are going to grow as your weapon gets better. So as you go from a bad leveling rare to a solid early endgame rare to some sort of early endgame unique, and then you upgrade to something that's a genuinely good crafted rare, then to a spectacular crafted rare, all of this time trauma support is providing roughly the same amount of damage, but other support gems that could be in its place would have been providing more because they'd be growing with the weapons that you're using. However, there is one big exception to this. There's a number of small exceptions as well, but the big exception is the Pillar of the Caged God. This is a phenomenal item to use in conjunction with trauma support. So, 16% increased physical weapon damage per 10 strength. I'm sure that you can find some pretty ridiculous shenanigans that you can play 
when you are stacking an enormous amount of trauma because of your use of trauma support. That is then going to be providing you with a tremendous amount of bonus flat physical, which is exactly the thing Pillar of the Cage God needs. You will no longer be stuck with using the low life only bloodthirst support, which is just not all that great. It is okay, and it does work really well with Pillar of the Cage God, but trauma support does that better, and there is definitely a build to be made here around this item. Additionally, Pillar of the Cage God was very common in 3.21. It was a tier five rarity unique, equal most common of all uniques in the game, and as a result, it's something that you can easily get your hands on. I am not going to guarantee that it will remain tier five in the next league, however. And next we have volatility support. This is incredible, and there's a lot of items I wanna showcase that work reasonably well with this. Firstly, let's talk about when volatility support is terrible. Imagine you have a weapon that reads, this weapon deals 100 to 100 physical damage. Now, broadly speaking, weapons with these stats don't exist, but if you did have that, then volatility support is actually going to lower the damage. It's going to be 31 to 158 damage, which is an average of 94.5 damage down from 100. Not only have you wasted a support gem, but you've lost 5.5% damage in doing it. Now, however, let's imagine a different weapon that's 0 to 100 damage. Now, your average damage per attack with that weapon is going to be 50, but with volatility support, it's actually going to jump up to 79. It's going to be a 58% more multiplier. In the real world, nothing is quite at these extremes. However, there are a few things that come close to them. Let's start with a couple of specific weapons. Voltaxic Rift. Oh my god, is this incredible in conjunction with this support gem. So Voltaxic Rift is as close as you can get to having 0 to 100 damage. It is 1 to 600 or 750. It is a very good weapon in general, and it's also very, very rare in the current state of the game. So this is one of the items that got gigabuffed in patch 3.20, but at the same time got made incredibly rare. All the divination cards that grant it are very rare as well. Don't count on getting this item easily, as it will be in much more demand in patch 3.22 than it has been in the past. But if you can get your hands on it, this is going to be absolutely phenomenal to use in conjunction with volatility support. The second item to use in conjunction with it is Rizlatha's Coil. Now this is for physical damage weapons, and Rizlatha's Coil is going to give you as much as 40% more maximum physical attack damage, and then anywhere from 30 to 40% less minimum physical attack damage. Because this is essentially providing more of the same stats volatility support does, albeit only for physical damage, it multiplies with it really well, and Rizlatha's Coil and volatility support will go together incredibly well. Another fair warning with Rizlatha's Coil, it is a very rare item. It's been off meta for a couple of leagues, so it hasn't been in hot demand, but it is known to be tier 1 rarity, so don't count on getting Rizlatha's Coil early easily. It does, however, have a divination card, and stack deck openers will definitely find a bunch of them, so you will find that there's a bunch of Rizlatha's Coils on the market from that, but this item is actually very, very rare. Keep that in mind, it's good. Along the same lines as Voltaxic Rift, we have the much more common, much more cheap, Hyorn's Fury. This provides a very large top-end amount of lightning damage. Keep this item in mind, we'll come back to it later. Essentia Sanguis is also similar, but Essentia Sanguis is phenomenally rare again, so it's not something I want to really try and encourage people to use, because only a small number of people can use it in a league. It is that rare. And of course, the last point that needs to be made for volatility support, and especially in conjunction with Rizlatha's Coil, is just how incredible this is with the Gladiator node, Violent Retaliation. Just like Rizlatha's Coil, just like volatility support, having lucky damage is better when the variance between your lowest possible damage and maximum possible damage becomes higher, and this is arguably the lowest opportunity cost way to get yourself lucky damage with attacks. So do keep it in mind, it works incredibly well with volatility support. Also, it's after 3.17, you don't need to be a gladiator, a bad ascendancy, in order to take a gladiator node. Late in the league at least, you can take this on a champion with Forbidden Jewels. Additionally, Bleed Bow Gladiators have been getting a lot of additional support in this patch, and who knows, maybe there is enough there to make it a real build again, so that you don't need to be a champion in order to effectively use a gladiator node. Final thoughts are that this is an incredibly, incredibly good support gem if you're playing a skill or if you're scaling with a weapon that primarily deals physical damage and or lightning damage, and you're willing to make a few changes to your build in order to fit it in. The 58% more maximum attack damage is so good that this gem is worth bending over backwards in order to fit it into your build, and this is probably the S tier gem out of this package. It's very simple, but it's something that's going to bring skills back into the limelight. Skills that have been serviceable but not great for a while will actually get a new lease on life because of volatility support. 
Next we have Locust Mine, and Locust Mine's damage is tremendous, but this is a very clunky skill. Essentially, the way I see this is that you want to use this as a ranged attack version of Frozen Legion. So Frozen Legion is something that takes a bit of a setup to use, you stand on top of a boss, you set it off, and then the boss takes damage from all around it. Locust Mine is sort of the same thing. The big cost to using Locust Mine is that you need to have a fair bit of mana on reserves so that you can dump a whole bunch of mines on the ground. The payoff for doing it though is considerable. You can then drop a whole bunch of mines on the ground, run behind the boss, and then set off detonation on this, and Locust Mine will just fire all of those projectiles at the boss all at once. I do think that this is going to be good, but I don't think many people are going to like using it. But there will definitely be people who use this and find it quite good. The key thing is, it's probably going to cost you an aura, at least when you're bossing, so keep that in mind. It's a high opportunity cost, but a very high payoff for it. Additionally, a bunch of people asked questions when I did the live stream about what the radius of 30 means. Basically, this means that you can't detonate your mines when you're within about 35% of a screen from them. So you need to stand a fair way away from your mines when you set this off. That's going to be very usable though. You drop it on the ground when you're about to reach a boss. You'll then run to the other side of the boss and then you'll detonate your locust mines and the mines will then fire and hit the boss really hard. Returning projectile support is next. This is one of those gems where the numbers aren't quite there for this to be an all-star, but the numbers are high enough that it is fine to use. This is going to be a 39% more multiplier to damage in the perfect scenario of a target dummy. Where you're stationary and the enemy is stationary, this is 39% more damage. However, in the real world, you might occasionally have to move and that will cause the returning projectile to simply not collide with the boss's hitbox. In those situations, you're going to lose out on that 39% more damage. I estimate that's going to happen between 5 and 10% of the time. If it's 5% of the time, this is still a worthwhile support. If it's 10% of the time, this is falling to 35% more damage range for a projectile support, which is, yeah, not really what I'm looking for. So keep that in mind, this is a usable support, it's not an extraordinarily good support. Also keep in mind that Vengeant Cascade got changed and now provides 150% increased projectile speed while the projectile is in the act of return, which is something that will increase the chance that the projectile on its return arc actually does intersect with the boss, but I don't think is necessarily worth the entire anointment for it. I think you can find better for an anointment than that. Okay, so next we have Sadism Support, which is the one that seems to be generating the most arguments online. This is one where a number of people are saying they can definitely see a use for it, and I am definitely thinking this is not good. Which is interesting because normally it seems to be the other way around. I want to quickly remind people about the Path of Building trap. Path of Building models encounters against a completely stationary enemy that doesn't retaliate to you in any way. In that scenario, that training dummy scenario, Sadism Support is going to be the best support gem for an Ignite build or for a Bleed build, almost all the time. However, where Sadism Support really falls off hard is when you have to dodge out of the way of something. Sadism Support is going to have two severe nerfs to the duration of the ailments you inflict. First, there's the third line, the obvious one, 80% less duration of ailments inflicted with supported skills. Then there's the upside, 79% faster. So what this means is that if you do a bleed that would inflict 50,000 damage over 5 seconds without Sadism Support, when you add in Sadism Support, you're going to lose that 80% duration, and that's going to mean that you're dealing 10,000 damage over 1 second instead of 50,000 damage over 5 seconds. Then the damage is going to be applied faster. So instead of it being 10,000 damage applied at 10,000 damage per second, it's going to be 10,000 damage applied at 17,900 damage per second, which is going to endure for about 560 milliseconds before it expires. Note that this is about an 88.8% .8 nerf to the ailment's total duration. This means that you're going to have DPS downtime unless you hit that monster again within 560 milliseconds. Now against the training dummy you can probably manage that on a lot of builds. Where it really is going to be a problem is when the boss interacts with you in some way and you're forced to run away from it. When that happens, sadism support is going to be laughing at you because you're not going to be able to apply any damage. Your damage over time effects are going to fall off really quickly and then potentially the monster might even regenerate some energy shield during this period as well, which is really going to be sadistic. So that's the drawbacks to sadism. It is a really high damage support. It is always going to be the one that looks best in path of building, but I don't think it's got what it takes in the current game. And I especially don't think it's got what it takes when you think about boss encounters where there's multiple bosses on the screen at once, 
where it is really advantageous. Like one of the main things that damage over time builds can do that gives them their unique utility is that they can be applying damage to all four bosses simultaneously. With sadism support, you're probably only applying damage to one of them at a time. And that feels like it's going to be particularly important in the 322 specific content as well. So, if you're playing an uber boss specialist and you've got a really tanky character idea that can stand toe to toe except during the very biggest slams, then yeah, by all means, use sadism support if you know what you're doing and you'll have a character that will work really well for that narrow use. But for general purpose use, I don't think this is the way to go. Where's the exception to this? If you are using puncture as your main skill, then puncture is going to work really well with it because bleed durations can be really good. Bleed durations can be phenomenal to the point that even dividing them by 9 with sadism support can still work out in your favour. So there are uses for this, but in general I think this is going to be the support gem that will have the largest number of people trying it and being actively disappointed with it. That's my final thoughts on sadism support right now. Devour support is next, dead on arrival. The numbers on this are too low, the delay on it looks to be 28 frames from what GGG showed earlier, and the only corner case I can see this being useful in is with another skill that uses Culling Strike on a Necromancer, but even then, no, nah, there's just much better ways to do everything you want to do with this. Devour support is a hard no. This is the worst of the new gems. The only reason it's not the most disappointing of the lot is that it's not going to trick people into trying it. It doesn't jump out at you and say, hey, try me, I'm at the top of your path of building list. Instead, people can look at this and just say no. Fresh Meat Support is next, and this one is going to be really interesting. So, if you're casting a minion that has unlimited duration, it will gain the benefits of Waken Fury for 10 seconds. If you're casting a minion that has a limited duration, it will instead gain it for one tenth of its duration. Now, Fresh Meat Support is going to provide a way to critically strike cap your minions. It's going to give 3.9% base critical strike, then on top of that, a 20% increase to critical strike chance as well. This is phenomenal. It's really hard to get minion critical strike chance into the stratosphere, and while you've got Wake and Fury, this will do exactly that. However, it is going to do so at the cost of you needing to keep resummoning your minions, and that's going to be difficult to manage. I do think that this has some uses. One thing I will state is that I don't like the idea that's being bounced around a lot of using this in conjunction with the Queen's Decree Unique Sword, mostly because I think you would be better off using two Convoking Wands instead. Even if your Convoking Wands aren't extraordinary, I do think you'll get a lot more benefit overall out of that. Melee Skeletons get a lot from Fresh Meat Support. This could be really good on Melee Skeletons, especially given that you generally do tend to over-summon your Melee Skeletons, so there's a lot there in this gem. This is potentially quite good, but it's also going to feel difficult to use. So only play around with this if you're okay with resummoning things very, very often, but if you are okay with that, then it does have the power there. It is something that's worth the clunkiness. Frigid Bond Support is next. This is also in the Dead on Arrival category, I believe. When this was originally spoiled, I was kind of keen to see how much it scaled up with gem levels, and whether it scaled as much as Searing Bond does. The answer is it doesn't, and as a result, I just don't think it's got the damage there. Maybe if you can get a level 35 one of this on a Forbidden Shaco, or 34, you'll use it and you'll link to an Animate Guardian, and you'll have this Icy Death Ray that is going to melt enemies, but for everything else, I don't think this is going to be worthwhile using at all. I think there's too much clunk involved, and whilst there's a payoff, the payoff just isn't quite high enough to justify it. Sacrifice Support is next, and we've saved one of the very best for second last. Sacrifice Support, if your character has 5,400 current life, now I'm saying current here, not maximum life, in this situation you will sacrifice 1,080 life, and the amount of damage that you get will be very close to commensurate with the damage that is provided by level 29 added Chaos Damage Support. Those of you who have ever used the unique chess piece, The Covenant, since it was gigabuffed in 319, will know just how much that is. That is a tremendous boost to the amount of damage that you're doing. There are a few particular uses for this. I think one that we need to experiment with a lot and find out all of the nuances about how it actually plays in-game is going to be Blade Vortex, but the real one is going to be Blade Blast. What you're going to want to do is probably have a setup that involves Dissolution of the Flesh and Wrathpinth Globe, in order to stack a very large amount of life, not necessarily quite as much as some of the Calm's Heart builds do, but stack maybe 10,000 life, then you're going to fire off a whole bunch of Ethereal Knives. While you're doing this, that's going to drain a lot of your life because of Wrathpinth Globe, which is then going to cause you to sacrifice life, so you're then going to have to drink some life flasks. But once you're back to full life, what you want to do is then cast Blade Blast and have that link to Sacrifice Support. The amount of damage that you're going to get from this is going to be shocking. 
It is going to be an unbelievable amount of damage, assuming that it works the way that I think it does. It's only a 70% effectiveness of added damage, but it could hit a single enemy 30 times, and therefore you end up doing something like 15,000 base chaos damage. And did I mention that because you're using Wrathpinth Globe, you've got all of the added spell damage percent you could want in the world, and also a tremendous amount of critical strike chance. This is a combination that I think could be very good. It all comes down to the exact interactions between Sacrifice Support and Blade Blast. But my understanding is that the first Blade Blast to explode will get all of the extra damage from Sacrifice Support, and will also propagate that to all of the others that it chain reacts to. So this has a lot of potential, but I do think it's got a lot of clunk to it. It feels like a skill that will insta-phase uber bosses while also being extremely unfun to play. And really, I mean, Blade Blast is like that in general, except maybe without the insta-phasing of uber bosses. Sacrifice support might be what's needed to take it up to that level. And finally, we have Spellblade support. This has a tremendous number of things you can use it with. This has phenomenally good numbers, miles higher than I was expecting. I want to point out a number of particular weapons you can use it with, but firstly note that it has to be a one-handed melee weapon. You cannot use this with two-handers. This is the most common misconception I see looking around. So let's have a look at a few weapons that are really good with it. Firstly, Hylon's Fury. We mentioned that earlier. Really, really good. And also related, Essentia Sanguis. We have White Wind. This is a very easy item to get again, and it adds a lot of cold damage and potentially a lot of cold damage to spells. We have Nycta's Lantern, which grants you Battle Mage already, and also provides you with both physical and fire damage together, so a lot of both of them. We'll go for one that's a little bit cute rather than good. Arakali's Fang actually has quite a bit more physical damage than I realised on it. Not necessarily the world's greatest thing, but it could be a new way to get your spider shenanigans started with Arakali's Fang, so something worth keeping in mind. With Camiria's Avarice, has a fair bit of damage for something that is usually really cheap. So Camiria's Avarice, you do need to go through the ordeal of making it as a vendor recipe from Camiria's Maul. You need to vendor a Camiria's Maul plus a 20 quality Glacial Hammer, 20 quality Ice Spear, 20 quality Ice Bite support, and then you will receive the upgraded version. The upgraded version does a lot, lot, lot of damage though. But perhaps most interesting of all, we have both the Rippling Thoughts and the upgraded version, which is named the Surging Thoughts, which does basically the same thing which will provide you with a fair amount of extra damage, but also provides you with a lot of spell damage at the same time. So you're using a weapon that is both providing you with a lot of damage through Spellblade, but that is also a decent spell weapon on its own. And then finally, there is Rebuke of the Vile for the absolute highest amount of damage that you can get. There's a few ways you can use this. You can use this in conjunction with Spellblade support and also an Elementalist, so that you're using Shaper of Flame, all this damage can then ignite, or you can use it in conjunction with Original Sin and convert all of this damage into chaos. But all in all, the numbers on Spellblade support are really good, and I do expect to see this be very widely used. This is a really strong gem, and it's something that is going to totally change the way casters gear, and especially it's going to make a bunch of items that were previously completely undesirable, that happened to roll by accident, is going to make them really, really good. So if you have something like tier 2 flat lightning damage to attacks, plus 1 to the level of lightning spell skill gems, and plus 1 to the level of all spell skill gems as prefixes on a weapon, that is suddenly a really good item. Whereas in the past, that attack damage on it would have been considered a completely wasted mod that was actually making the item worse than it otherwise was. Okay, so that is the Day 9 summary. I'm going to leave it there. May your Valobs have interesting results, and I will see you around.